morning radiant. Let's get ready to worship our God this morning. I want you to open up, loosen up, because we're going to celebrate Jesus. We can celebrate the Broncos later, but we'll celebrate Jesus right now with everything we've got, okay? Let's do this.
you've done for me. Come on, let's sing it all over this building. Worthy is, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. We sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy.
God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are alive and you are here in our midst right now. We praise you. Right now, we are going to continue worshiping our God through the act of Holy Communion. So if you could go ahead and have a seat just for a moment as the ushers begin to distribute the elements this morning. Um, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then we invite you to participate in this wonderful act this morning with us. And what we, what we ask for you to do is just hold on to those elements for just a few moments, and we're going to take them together uh, just a bit. But as you do take them, as you hold on to them, just take a moment to just come before the Lord and see if there's anything between you and the Lord that's preventing you from receiving everything that he has for you today. And if there's anything there that's just hindering that in your life right now, go ahead and just lay those things at the, at the foot of the cross and get rid of those things today. And then we're going to continue worshiping our God through this act of holy communion. So why don't we take some time and do that this morning. as love, your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. The Lord be magnified. 
magnified. Let's say that together. The Lord be magnified. One more time. The Lord be magnified. See, today we're taking a communion, which is representative of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, and remembering what Jesus did on, the, on that cross. And so would you hold the bread up? And Jesus, we remember that you went through, what you endured on that cross. Even though we deserved it, you went through it. And so we remember you right now, what you did, how you took it upon yourself, even though it should have been for us. And so we thank you, and we remember you right now, we magnify you. Go ahead and take the breath. That's why we're here this morning, is it not? Father, we thank you that you chose to send your son Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for all that you did, for who you are, for what you did for us. We thank you that even before you went to that cross, you knew every single person in this room. You knew we'd be here worshiping you this day. And so we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's sing together. We sing hallelujah.
on, church. Don't stop worshiping. Come on, in your own words, give it praise, give it adoration. God is amazing. Say with me, God is good. And we love him. So again, my name is Andres and uh, I'm a worship leader here. And uh, I just want to thank you for allowing me to worship with you and, and, and just enter in the presence of God. You guys sound amazing. Um, right now, we just want to take some time and, and just greet one another, shake some hands. That's another aspect of worship, you know, getting to know each other. And uh, if you see anybody that you don't know, make sure to make him feel welcome, and then you may be seated. Thank you so much. Oh, well, good morning, Radiant Church. It's great to see you. There's a lot of good conversations happening today. There's also a lot of orange in here today. <laughs> something's going on today, right? There's something happening, I think. There's something in the air. Something's going on. Hey, you know what? We're all going to be having fun celebrating and enjoying a great game you know later today but you know what right here this is really what it's all about right here this is worshiping our God you know what I love it when we get to come together and do something that has really eternal significance right hey the game's gonna be fun and great later today but let's keep things in perspective right let's keep things in perspective because God is so good he's so good and that's why we're here this morning we get to worship him and now if you're newer to Radiant Church we do welcome you here right now. Can we give everyone who's new to Radiant Church just a warm, radiant welcome? We, we do know that you could be doing all kinds of things on a Super Bowl Sunday morning, uh, but you chose to be here with us this morning. And so we're truly blessed and honored that, that each and every one of you chose to be here today. And if you are newer to Radiant Church, if you would do us a quick favor and grab one of these connection cards, it's right in the back of the seat there in front of you, and you can... You can fill that out. It just takes a moment to do so. And then at the end of service, we're going to be receiving today's tithes and offerings. And when the buckets go around at that time, you can place that in the buckets. Once again, it's going to be near the end of the service today. Um, but one, one thing to just bring to your attention, if you are newer to Radiant Church, one of the great ways to hear more about the church, just to hear what Radiant Church is all about, what we're doing here in the community, how to connect with one another, is to go to our Ascent class. It's going to be this Wednesday night at 6.30, right in the lodge room, which is right across the foyer. And in that class, you're going to hear about all kinds of ways you can connect here at Radiant and just hear really what the heartbeat of Radiant Church is. So we encourage you to go to the Ascent class. It's actually a series of four classes. You can take them in any order. And so this Wednesday at 6.30 is our Ascent 201. So we encourage you to be a part of that. And um, right now, let's go ahead and pray as we prepare to re uh, receive the word and the message from, that Pastor Todd's going to share with us right now. Okay, would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you, Lord, that we get to be here worshiping you because we know, God, that you are why we're here. You are the one that is, is our supplier. You are the one that's our provider. You are the one that's our protector. You're the one who empowers us, God, to 
do the works of your ministry here on this earth. And so, Lord, as we seek your face right now, God, I pray that you'd prepare our hearts and our minds to receive everything that you have for us right now. Let there be nothing that hinders us. God, we just, we just command all uh, obstacles, all confusion, anything that's trying to block us from understanding and hearing your word today to leave in the name of Jesus so that we can focus in and receive it. God, we speak your anointing over Pastor Todd as he comes to share. And let the words that come out of his mouth come forth in your Holy Spirit's power and penetrate our very lives. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. This is Pastor Ara Torosian. Uh, I'm from Iran. I'm going to start uh, my story with this, that I born in 1979 in middle of revolution in Iran. I became Christian at the age of 16, and, and my life changed. I remember I was going to the church, and my friends, my old friends, they start to bully me, and they start to throw a stone. Say, why are you going to the church? Why are you going to church? That was my first persecution. And I remember in, in that days, I was praying that, God, I love you. Uh, I will follow you even if I die. In the beginning of my journey, faith journey, uh, I realized that God called me to plant the church. And my first church was my family. I was the first Christian. Then my mom and my dad became Christian and we start Bible study and our home changed. I went back to Iran and realized that people need Bible. You know, in in less than six months, I planned seven church, uh, underground church. The church was closed in Iran. We couldn't go to building and we start to preach the go uh, gospel to Muslim background people. We took some of our leaders to neighbor country and we usually took a smuggler Bible to our suitcases. And I saw somebody, one of my friends, is coming with big box of Bible and took. Uh, and I said, no. And at that moment, I was so scared. And so they caught him. And they took him in, uh, in the small room. I was watching it and I said, oh, don't tell my name, don't tell my name. And he came out of the room and he pointed his finger on me. <laughs> I was saying, oh man, just got one or two slab and then gave my name. <laughs> so uh, he gave my name, I ran. So I was scared, I was everything, like everything changed in my life. I was fear, full of fear, so scared. And I say, everything finished. I came in front of my house and there was three people waiting for me. They blindfolded me. And I said, where is your paper? And they start to punch and um, it says, go, we need to talk to you. And they took me in a dark, cold room. Um, and then I realized that was a heavy prison. They, they start to torture me. Uh, the first thing that they did it was upside down. Then they start to punch me to give the names, networks, the names of believers. And I said, this is the moment I have to stand for my brothers and sisters, one with them. I'm not going. I said, Lord, just give me strength. I remember this verse that God is my helper. God is our helper. I remember the day that they took me to the offices and they, they kept me for six hours. They tortured me again. It was, it was a stone they used uh, for door stopper. Um, so they start to hit on my knee with that stone. <sighs> it was full of pain, my knee, and I was angry. I said, why are you doing this? Just leave me alone. They showed the video that one of my brothers, Christian brothers, that I have a very close friend, uh, accountable to him. Uh, they showed this video that he was giving my information. He said, look, you're not working with us. See what's happened. And they showed the video that he was giving all information about me to the government people. That moment, 
kill my my soul and spirit. He said, why? He said, why, Lord, take this from me. I can't handle it. And then I realized the forgiveness of God. If you don't give, you don't get. And that moment, God like changed my heart. And I, that moment, I start to pray my persecutor. If we want to reach the world, we need to repent first. We need to forgive. And then God will put the love. Trust me, since then, <laughs> God gave me love for my persecutor. Trust me or not, I'm not a dreamer. I cannot dream sometimes in my, 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 when I slept. But most of my dreams is face of these guys that took me and tortured me. Anytime I wake up, you know, I pray for them. I say, Lord, thank you for giving me and remind me their faces that I can pray for them. I love them. If they can hear this, I love you. And I'm praying for you one day you can realize that how truth is the Bible and how truth is Jesus and how Jesus can give you uh, eternity through his cross and his blood. We just watched an intense video from Ara, our friend who was here a month or so ago and received an offering for the persecuted church in Iraq. Today's message is a little sobering because we're talking about persecution, we're talking about suffering, and we're talking about a biblical term called submission. And we're going to be looking at those scriptures today from 1 Peter. So if you'd like to turn there, we're in a verse-by-verse -verse study of that book, and I'd like to welcome all of you that are watching online, and we're so delighted to have you as part of our service today. So we have been in 1 Peter looking at who we are, and Peter always starts there, Paul always starts there. Who are we? Who has God made us to be? Because you never can operate and live contrary to who you really believe yourself to be. And so Peter has told us that we're God's elect. We're born-again people. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that we're living stones within the temple of God, that we're being built in Jesus Christ with him being the chief cornerstone, and we're being built as part of his temple, and we are also priests within that temple. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're the people of God. That's who we are. Now, based on who we are, Peter's going to tell us how we behave, how we should live, how we should act. And we're going to find that our new identity comes with a distinct lifestyle. And he points out that we are pilgrim warriors, we are free servants, and we are called sufferers. Let's start with our identity as pilgrim warriors, beginning in verse 11 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims. He says, beloved, right off, Peter reminds us that we are the loved of God, regardless of what people may be saying about it, regardless of how we may feel about our circumstances and situations, and even about ourselves, God loves us. And we really can't hear that enough, because some of us get so down on ourselves, and our situation becomes such that we begin to question the love of God, and maybe these people are doing so. But he reminds them, you're the beloved of God. And he says, I beg you. That's pretty strong terminology. I beg you. And he calls them sojourners and pilgrims. And as you remember, throughout 1 Peter, Peter keeps echoing back to the Old Testament scripture. He keeps echoing back to the Old Testament times. And he's talking here about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were sojourners and pilgrims. God had given them the land of promise, but when they went to the land of promise, that really wasn't their home country. So they never built a house. They just wandered as pilgrims and aliens. And they settled, but never settled down. They settled into what God had for them there, but they were living next to people who had settled down and considered that their permanent home. Now, if you're a sojourner and a pilgrim, you aren't allowed to assimilate. You know, it's interesting in Christianity that some people will say, well, that's a Western religion, which is absolutely preposterous. It started in the East, and eventually it came to the West. 
And Christianity really fits in any part of the world. It can fit within any culture. And yet at the same time, to some degree, it's always going to go against the culture. In America, I think we have increasingly moved from being a culture to a subculture to being counterculture. And usually, in any culture Christianity finds itself, to some degree, it's going to be countercultural. That certainly was true of the day in which Peter's writing. You see, they were in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had a very different view of life. To begin with, they didn't value life. They didn't value humanity. And so because of that, they actually practiced infanticide, where if they didn't want their children, they would just put them outside and let them fend for themselves, which meant they died. And Christians would gather up these children and raise them as their own because they had a much higher value on human life. When it came to sexuality, Christians believed that marriage was a gift from God, but it needed to be celebrated within the context of covenant married love. The Romans didn't believe that. But the Christians would say it's one man and one woman in this relationship, and that's the only boundary in which God wants sex to operate. They also had a very high view of women. You see, in the Roman Empire, they saw women certainly as, at best, second-class citizens. They wouldn't even let women oftentimes be educated. So there were very few educated women within the Roman Empire. However, Christians elevated women. They were taught, they were instructed, and they were considered equals. Unlike most of their neighbors, the Christians were extremely generous. They gave to the poor, but they certainly took care of one another. And while the Roman men would go to the Colosseum along with the Roman women to watch men battle it out as gladiators and kill one another, and in cold blood they would celebrate this brutality, the Christians refused to go to the Colosseums. Now, most radically, the Roman Caesars were deified. They were considered gods. You see, Rome worshipped all kinds of deities. And Christians said, no, we're, mono, we're monotheists. We believe in one God who's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. But they said, no, there's many gods, but we deify Caesar. He's the primary god. So they worshiped Caesar. It was part of their patriotism. And so every Roman citizen was called on to take a pinch of incense and declare Caesar is Lord. However, the Christians wouldn't do it. They said, no, there's only one Lord, God, Savior, and King, and his name is Jesus. And they said, Jesus is Lord. And so because of that, they suffered persecution, increasing levels of persecution. Verse 11, Peter then writes, Abstain from fleshly lust, which wars against the soul. So not only are we sojourners and pilgrims, but we're also warriors. The Bible tells us from Philippians that Paul calls us citizens of heaven. We have a different worldview. We have a different mindset. So we're pilgrims. We're aliens here. We're really citizens of heaven. But we're not only sojourners and pilgrims. We're also warriors. There's a battle that's going on. And Peter says that battle is for our soul. And the battle is both outward and the battle is inward. On the outside, we battle the world, this culture that's always pushing us another way. Christians are always going against the stream. Second of all, there is the battle going on against principalities and powers, as Paul calls them in Romans chapter 6. There are true, unseen, dark entities that are warring against us. And finally, we have the battle internally. The battle of what the scripture calls spirit against flesh. That there is this constant pull to be who we used to be instead of being who we are in Christ. And so there's this constant war going on. And in that day, Roman warfare was quite interesting. They would come to overcome a city, and the way they would do it is they would make their own city. They would build a camp city around about the city. And so there was a city within the city, and their camp city or their soldier's city would be there for sometimes weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years, but they were very patient until they could finally overcome the enemy. And I want you to understand that encamped around about us all the time is the world, the flesh, and the devil. Encamped around about us all the time 
are those destructive forces that are after our soul to destroy our faith in God and to lead us away from Jesus Christ. And it's going on all the time. The problem is a lot of us don't recognize it. We just tend to float with the current of life. We've got to stop and recognize we're in a battle. Those temptations you're feeling, those attacks that are coming after you, those are part of the warfare to destroy your soul. And you have to make the decision that at any cost, I'm going to protect my soul. My relationship with God is more important than anything else. And unless you make that decision, you're going to lose the battle. And so we're pilgrim warriors. And then he says in verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. True Christianity begins on the inside. We have an encounter with Jesus Christ, and we're changed. The Bible calls it new birth. We're a new person on the inside. But that inner change that is born witness in our spirit eventually is seen in our external behavior. I think about the Welch Revival in the 1920s. There was a mighty move of God in Wales, and Wales was a coal mining country, and so the coal mines suddenly began to be slowed down, and they didn't know what the problem was. Well, they figured it out. It was the pit ponies. The pit ponies didn't know what to do anymore because their masters had always been yelling at them, screaming profanities, but now these miners had come to Christ, and now they spoke in more gentle and kind and and less cursing words. And so because of that, the ponies didn't know what to do and they had to be retrained. That's called a major change of life that affected the world around them. And sometimes it affects negatively in that sense, but overall it's a very positive change that we bring when we come to Christ. And we have to ask ourselves, have our, have our conduct changed? Has our conduct changed? Have we started living different lives? And Peter says, we should be living different lives. We should have a complete change in the way we live. However, that's not always accepted very well. Look at uh, verse 12. He says that when they speak against you as evildoers. Notice, when they speak. It didn't say if they speak. It said when. Let me tell you, when you're a follower of Christ, somebody's going to speak evil of you. And so you just need to get used to it. They spoke evil of Jesus, they're going to speak evil of you. I remember when I had a newfound faith in Christ, I was uh, in college, and between my junior and senior year, I went uh, to another town nearby and started a business. And so I took a year off college to run a business. Well, there's nothing that can drive you to God like starting your own business. (laughs) And that's what happened to me. I fully committed my life to Christ, had a radical change, and then once my business got running well, I went back to school. And when I went back to college, you'd think that my friends would be excited for me. I mean, I was a much better friend. I was far less selfish, more considerate, more concerned about them, but they didn't want a lot to do with me anymore because I didn't do what I used to do. I didn't go to the places I used to go. I was changed, and rumors started about me. No, Todd's gotten religion. Hudnall's changed. He doesn't want to do what we do anymore. I think he thinks he's better than us now. Well, none of that was true, but that's what happens when your life is changed and you begin following Jesus. Now, that is nothing compared to what these early Christians were facing. There were all kinds of rumors about them. One of them was that they were cannibals. And the reason for that is they did what we did today, and we received the Lord's table where they were eating the body of the Lord and drinking his blood, so they said they were cannibals. They were even accused of incense, incest. They were accused of incest because they called each other brother and sister. Not only that, but they were even called atheists because they didn't worship the emperor and their God was invisible. Goes on to say that they are going to speak to you as evildoers. And then it says, but by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I love that. You see, with Jesus, some people attacked him. Others were drawn to him. And the same thing happens to us when we come to Christ. Some people are drawn to us while other people attack us. And this is saying on the day of visitation, they're going to give glory to God for your life. Now, what is the day of visitation? Well, I think when you read the writings of Peter, you certainly could see it as the second coming of Jesus. But I think in the context of this actual verse... 
It's referring to that visitation when God visits us on an individual basis. Somebody has said that Christianity isn't something you take up, it's something that takes you up. That God gets a hold of your life. That there's a time when God visits your life. And I think this is what it's talking about. When these people that are antagonistic toward the gospel receive Jesus Christ, there is such a change in their life, and they have so experienced Jesus because of the change in your life. They have seen your light, and they have received Christ themselves, and so they're glorifying God for you. And I think a lot of us know what that's like. Where you came to Christ because of somebody in your relational world whose light shined brightly for Jesus. And so I believe that's what that passage is saying. So we have found that we are pilgrim warriors. We're in a hostile world, that we are aliens in a battle. And we now learn that as citizens of heaven, living in this alien world, that we are to submit. We are learning that we are to relate to the world through submission as servants. Now, let's talk about that word, word submit. Because submit, to many of us, has a very negative connotation. Yet Peter is explaining that it is a key to freedom. And that's why we're free servants. And that's the second description of our lifestyle. We're free servants. Look at verse 13. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now, let me give you a definition of submission that was used in the time that Peter is writing. It was to stand under in an orderly fashion. And it was usually used of military array. So, in other words, you have your soldiers that have a commander, and that commander has a general, so there is an array of submission in order to accomplish a purpose. However, the Christians took that word and added a definition to it. For a Christian, for those in the New Testament, the word was always related to serving, so that we stand under another ready to serve them in love. But our submission or our standing under always starts by standing under Jesus, and that's so important to understand. Our primary submission is to God. And there is no other submission that can come between us and our submission to Jesus. So submission and obedience are not always the same thing. You can be submitted and not obey, and you can obey and not be submitted. I heard a story about a little boy who was being a bit defiant to his dad. And his dad told him to sit down, and he wouldn't. So the dad reaches over, grabs him by the shoulders, and slams him down into his chair. The little boy sat there, sat there stewing. And finally the little boy said, well, I am sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> now what that is, is obedience without submission. You see, obedience is an action while submission is an attitude. And so at the same time, you can submit without being obedient. And if I had the time, I could go through a number of biblical examples of this, because there's a lot of them. But I'm going to give you the classic. And this one involves Peter himself, and you can find it over in Acts chapter 4. You probably remember the story, if you've read the book of Acts, that the church is being threatened. And they're told, you can no longer preach in the name of Jesus. You can no longer proclaim the gospel. And Peter says this, in a very submitted way to his government, the Sanhedrin would have been over him. They were the religious authorities in that day. And Peter says, we're going to have to obey God rather than you. That's it. Their first allegiance, their first obedience was to Jesus Christ. So in Acts 4.13, Peter said, Jesus told us to preach the gospel. You're telling us we can't, and to obey you would be to disobey Jesus, so we're going to have to obey God rather than man. So we always need to be submissive, but we don't always have to obey. And that is a critical principle when we're studying the subject of submission and obedience. Submission does not mean slavery, and not even necessarily obedience, but it is a recognition of God's authority in our lives. And as we submit to delegated authorities that God has put in place, we're submitting to God. And we respect and submit to God's human delegated authorities, remaining submitted to God and His authority first. 
So that means we never blindly follow government dictators. We never blindly follow uh, autocratic leaders. We submit to them, but we don't always do what they say, which means you can't be like the majority of the culture around us who just kind of nod their head and say, yes, whatever my political leader says, that's what I'm going to do. You have got to say, no, what does God say? What does God's word say about this? What does the scripture say? Because I've got to obey God rather than man. And yes, I may submit to you, but I will not obey you if that means I disobey Jesus. Is that, is that something you're all tracking with here? And then he says, it's for the Lord's sake. When we submit to delegated authority, first of all, it's like we're submitting to the Lord. And second of all, when we submit to delegated authority, we're doing it for God's purpose because God set delegated authority where it is. Verse 13, whether to the king as supreme. So he's going through a number of examples of delegated authority, and the first one's the king. Well, who was the king in Rome? Caesar Nero, an evil, wicked, despicable despot. But Paul says that we're to submit to him. And understand, the entire Roman political system was corrupt. And now, understand, there is a true king that's coming. His name is Jesus. And when he comes, there's going to be perfect governance, and there's going to be perfect justice. But until that time, God gives us delegated authority, and we have to respect it. Now, I know many of you are like me. I don't always agree with our government. I don't always agree with the decisions that our government makes. And I think it's our responsibility as Christians when they violate scriptural truth and scriptural principles that we don't agree with them, and we're very firm about that. There may even come a time where our government says we are to do something and to obey, but we can't obey because to obey the government means to disobey Jesus, and so we have to obey God first. And that's where the problem comes in. That's where the problem came in for these people that Peter is writing to. And I think it's a very real issue that we have to begin to consider. Look at verse 14. He goes on to say, or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. Now, you've got to understand, God set up human governments for a purpose. And here he outlines it. It's to restrict crime and to stop wrongdoing and to encourage civil order. Now, some governments can become so corrupt that they don't even do that. But the Roman government was doing that at this time, and our government does that. Look at verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, many of the Christians were being spoken of in a very negative way. Because they didn't always obey all the laws of the land and they didn't follow all of the customs and all of what the culture was saying to do, there were very bad things spoken about them. However, what is being told them by Peter is, if you will be a model citizen, if you will be an honorable person in this society, if you will submit and honor your government, then you're going to put to silence all of these that are speaking in a negative way against the faith that we have in Jesus. Now, in saying all that, you've got to understand something. I said we're primarily citizens of heaven, but that doesn't change the fact that we have a dual citizenship. We're also citizens of this country. And as citizens of this country, if we're first of all citizens of Jesus, then we should be the very best citizens in this country, even if sometimes we can't do what the culture is saying because Jesus said something else. So then he goes on in verse 16, to say, as free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of Christ. And this is such a critical biblical principle. He is saying we are free servants, but that doesn't mean that we're free to sin. That means we're free to serve. It doesn't mean we're free to live contrary to the scripture. It means we're free to be fully committed servants of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, he says, honor all people. And that would have been astonishing in that day. Because in that day, the Roman Empire was filled with slaves. And slaves were considered less than human. And he's being told here, he's telling us, 
that we are to honor all people. Also, as I said, the king at that time in Rome, the emperor, was Nero, who was an awful, despicable man, but you're to honor him. We're to honor all people. Why? Because all people have been made in the image of God. Because of the Imago Dei. We are made in the image of God, so every person made in the image of God needs to be honored and respected. Whether you agree with them or not, no matter how they're living, even no matter how they're acting at that time, we need to honor them as human beings because God made them in His image. Verse 17, love the brotherhood. Believers are encouraged to love one another. Fear God. Now, this is speaking about reverential respect for God, and if we really will respect God, then we'll respect His delegated authority. goes on to say, honor the king. Again, this is God's delegated authority. And let me say this. You honor them whether you agree with them or not. Whether you like them or not, you still honor them. And I think this is a very important word for us in the day in which we live. Because it's an election year. And I'm amazed the way politicians are hated and vilified in our society when they're running for office. To me, it's extraordinary that in the same political party, you can have a number of candidates who, on what they believe, there's very little variance. I mean, they basically are standing for the same thing, and yet one who supports this one can totally vilify and demonize the other one on the other side who really basically is saying the same thing. That is extraordinary to me. And as followers of Jesus, we have no absolutely no right to get involved in that process. We have no right to villainize and demonize those running for political office. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to go along with them all the time. You don't even have to obey them even when they're in office. But what you must do is respect them and honor them for their office because Jesus Christ put them there. And in honoring them, you're honoring Jesus. Even on social media. Especially on social media. I think that's in the Bible here somewhere, but. (laughs) And then he says, servants. Now, when he uses the word servants, you need to know that servants were everywhere. Um, This word is talking about household slaves. There's another word that is in the Greek language that probably some of you are familiar with, if you know any Greek, and it's the word doulos. That's a very well-known Greek word, but that's not the word used here. This is talking about household slaves because slavery in the Roman Empire was much different than New World slavery here in the United States. Uh, Slaves often were better educated than their masters. So you could have slaves who were managers of estates. You could have slaves who were doctors. You could have slaves that were attorneys. Slaves were all over the place, and they were doing all kinds of different tasks. Now, it is said that in Rome itself, there were three slaves for every freeman. Isn't that extraordinary? It's said that in the Roman Empire, there were 60 million slaves, but you've got to realize there were only 120 million people living in the Roman Empire. So half of the population were slaves. And again, I want to say it wasn't like New World slavery. New World slavery was essentially kidnapping people and putting them into bondage. Whereas in that day, a lot of people were slaves because they were indentured slaves. They owed a great debt they couldn't pay back, and so they had to sell themselves into slavery, or they had to sell their family into slavery. Others of them were those who had been conquered by Rome, and because of that, they were made slaves, and slaves were everywhere. And so he says in verse 18, as he moves on, servants, be submissive to your masters, with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. You've got to understand that there were some really good slave owners, very kind, good men and women. And so these people would almost treat their slaves oftentimes as family members. However, there were others who were very harsh and very cruel and very brutal, and it was very unjust. In fact, Aristotle said this, a slave is a living tool, and a tool is an inanimate slave. In other words, they didn't see slaves as human beings. They saw them as tools, as inanimate objects that just happened to be alive. Now, as awful as slavery could be, 
It's fascinating that in the New Testament, neither Paul nor Peter call for the abolition of slavery. Neither one of them tells slaves to rebel against their masters. You're not going to find that. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's quite a practical point. In that day, the church was very, very small, and they were very, very marginalized, and they were beginning to be quite persecuted. And so they would have no say or no influence in changing slavery in the Roman Empire. In fact, to stand against it in the sense of saying it needs to be overthrown would only have led to more persecution and more devastation on the church. However, over the next four centuries, slavery is completely eliminated in the Roman Empire because of Christianity. Because over time, more and more people in the Roman Empire committed them, their lives to Christ were converted and became followers of Jesus. And because they believed that man was made in the image of God, slavery eventually completely faded out. Now you come into the new world. Uh, You come, well, for instance, to England. In England, uh, slavery was abolished because of Christians. The Christians were the abolitionists. William Wilberforce gave his life to the elimination of slavery. Here in America... Those who drove the abolition movement did it in the name of Jesus. They did it according to Scripture. And that's what Scripture will always do. That's what God's Word will always do. When people's hearts are changed and they are staying true to the Scripture, they're always going to say men need to be dignified and they need to be free. But Peter here is teaching us a principle, and it's a very important principle. The principle Peter is teaching is that instead of cursing and railing against your situation, you need to embrace it for the Lord's sake. You accept it for God's glory. So if you're a slave and you're in that situation, instead of cursing your slavery, instead of hating and despising your master, embrace it and say, God has me here and he has me here for a purpose. If I can gain my freedom, says Paul, that's great. Go for it. But if you can't gain your freedom, don't curse your situation. Embrace your situation and say, I'm going to use this situation for the glory of God. You say, well, how does that have any relevance to me? Well, I'll tell you how it does. Because a lot of you feel like slaves. Maybe you feel like you're in bondage to a relationship you're in. Maybe you feel like a slave in your job. Maybe you feel like a slave to a situation or a circumstance you're in, and it's devastating to you. You live in constant complaint because of that situation, and you're constantly complaining to God and and railing on the situation and cursing the day this ever came into your life. What Peter is saying, instead of that, embrace it for the glory of God. Now, if you can get out of it, that's great. If you can get free from it, that's fine. But as long as Jesus has you there, you embrace it and say, in the middle of this, God's purpose is going to be fulfilled and Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. And that changes everything. You say, but what if the situation I'm in really leads to serious suffering? Well, that's the final point Peter brings out in this passage. And that is that we are called sufferers called sufferers. You see, in life, suffering is inevitable. You're going to suffer. <laughs> it's just to what degree. Some people suffer far more than others, but all of us go through times of suffering. And the Bible is less concerned about why we suffer and far more concerned in what we do in the middle of suffering and how we can overcome in suffering. And sometimes people suffer because of their own foolish decisions and because of their own sinful acts. And that is not what Peter is talking about here. Look at verse 19. Peter says, For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. He says it's admirable if you're doing everything right, but you're suffering anyway. And in this case, the slave has chosen to suffer for Christ's sake. And so he's no longer a victim because he's chosen. His master cannot enslave him because he's Christ's slave. He cannot be humiliated because he's decided to humble himself to serve. And Jesus introduced this principle in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he says, if somebody slaps you on one side of the cheek, turn the other to him. He said, if somebody commands you to carry their pack a mile, well, then carry it two miles. What was that about? That was about what we're talking about today. That is where Peter got this principle, the Peter principle. And here's what it is. That if somebody slaps you, you're a victim. You're being abused. It's unjust. You've been slapped. You're a victim. However, once you turn the other cheek, you've chosen, and you're no longer a victim. Now you're victorious. Or, and this comes right out of history, in the Roman culture, according to Roman law, if you're a Jew, and remember, Jesus was a good Jewish boy, this could have happened to him, that if a Roman soldier came to you and said, I command you to carry my pack a mile, by Roman law, you had to carry it a mile, but within their law, after a mile, you didn't have to carry it anymore. And so what a Jew would do is if he were commanded to carry a pack, typically he would go a mile, and after a mile he would slam the pack down, he would curse, and he would run because he was a victim. However, this is saying you carry the pack a mile, and you're a victim. But at the end of that mile, you say, hey, I want to serve you. I think I'll carry your pack another mile. Now you're no longer a victim. You have chosen, and you're victorious. And that's the difference. That's the difference. He is showing us how in suffering and in situations we don't want anything to do with that God has a way to redeem the situation for his glory and to make us a victor. Now, this is not condoning evil, but it is allowing God to work out his redemption in the midst of evil. But here's the problem with this. There are no rules. See, some of you are already thinking that. Well, what about this far? And what if this happens? And what's the rule if you don't? I mean, when do you? There's no rule. There's no rule. You know why? Because this is mainly a relationship with Jesus. So Jesus is sitting before the Sanhedrin. They're sitting. He's standing. Jesus is standing before the Sanhedrin. And one of the men reaches over and slaps him across the face. Okay, Jesus, back in Matthew 5, you said, turn the other cheek. Let's see you do it. And Jesus said, why'd you slap me? That's unjust. That's against the law. Why did you slap me? If I've done something wrong, slap me, but I haven't done anything wrong. Jesus, you're violating your commandment. It's not a commandment. It's a principle. There are times to stand up for justice. There are times, especially when other people are being hurt, that you go against the flow and you stand up and say, this is not just, this is not right, and God wants justice. I think about the man or the woman that's in a relationship, they're married, and it's an abusive situation. And that woman says, I'm not created to be a punching bag. And as much as I love my husband and as much as I want to submit myself in this situation and as much as I want to use it for the glory of God, it's time for me to step out of this situation. But there's no rule. There's no rule. Do you mind if I throw in a story here that's not in my notes and will take us another minute over? All I need is one person. All I need is one person. Okay, there we go. Okay. I heard a story about an old Pentecostal preacher who became quite well known, and God used him in a great way, but before he came to Christ, he was very difficult to live with for his wife, particularly because she had received Jesus Christ, and he said, I don't want you going to church anymore, and she looked at her husband, and she said, God has commanded me not to forsake the assembling together with other believers, so she went to church. She said, I love you, but I've got to obey Jesus. She went to church. He locked her out of the house. She comes home. The door's locked. She can't get in the house. So he goes to bed that night. And he wakes up and thinks, what have I done? I have such a good wife. She's such a wonderful woman. Why would I act like that? So he ran to the front door. He unlocked the door, opened it up, and his wife came rolling in. She She had been laying on the patio all night. She comes in. She stands up and says, honey, it's so good to see you. Gives him a kiss and said, what can I make you for breakfast? And he, right there, committed his life to Jesus. You say, I can't believe she did that. Why would she do that? Because she sensed that's what Jesus wanted her to do. And God redeemed the situation for his glory. (laughs) But there's no rules. We just have to follow Jesus. 
But the principle is that instead of being victims, we're going to embrace our situation by choice to be victorious and give God the glory and for God's purpose and will to be fulfilled in the situation. Look at verse 20. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, then this is commendable before God. Now, suffering because of something you've done that is wrong is simply a consequence of your actions. But suffering when you've only done good and embracing it for the glory of God is something to be noticed, and God notices it, and he says it's commendable. Now, there is a story that's stunning to me from the pre-Civil War days. There was a woman who was a slave, and in a very um, abusive situation, she was abused and treated far worse than most slaves were. And somebody overheard her prayer and wrote it down. And her prayer was this, oh God, save my master, save his soul. Don't damn his soul when he asks you to. When he whips me, forgive him. Forgive me for those thoughts in my soul which are unkind, save him. That takes the grace of God. And that is commendable to God, that is redemptive, and that glorifies Jesus Christ. And that kind of response requires resting fully in Christ. Look at verse 21. It says, for to this you were called. Called to what? To wrongfully suffer. (laughs) You were called to suffer, he says. Why? Verse 21 goes on to say, because Christ also suffered for us, having left us an example that you should follow his steps. We're followers of Jesus. And Jesus suffered wrongfully. So when we are suffering wrongfully, we're simply following Jesus. Verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Do you hear that? Jesus had no deceit, no sin. He's the only sinless person who ever lived, yet he suffered unjustly. If anybody deserved to never suffer unjustly, it was Jesus. But if he suffered, we're going to suffer. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Now, I really want you to hear this because I'm going to pull all together what we've been talking about. Jesus went to the cross not as a victim because he chose to be there. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, I'd do anything not to go to the cross, but not my will, your will be done. So he chose the will of the Father, and he was nailed to a cross. And sometimes he didn't understand all that was going on. So he said, my God, my God, why? You know, sometimes you don't understand it. God, why am I having to go through this? Why is this necessary? Why is this happening? We say, why? But we say, this is what God has for me. God has a redemptive purpose in this. So I am going to embrace this to his glory. And the scripture says that Jesus said that he could have called for 60,000 angels to come and rescue him. They could have absolutely devastated all of those persecuting him. But he chose not to because he chose to do the will of the Father. He embraced God's will for a redemptive purpose. And whatever situation you're in, as much as you hate it, as much as you'd like out of it, embrace it for the glory of God. And say, God, you've got a purpose in this, and you're going to be glorified in this. I don't know what your situation is. Maybe it's illness. Maybe it's sickness. And you've been cursing that sickness, and you feel so self-pitying, and you feel so horrible about it, and God, why me? And this isn't right. There's nothing wrong with believing God to heal you physically. There's nothing wrong with going to the doctor. There's nothing wrong with seeking relief. However, when you're at a place where there's nothing more you can do, instead of whining and complaining about it, you embrace it and say, God, I don't know why, but I know I'm here, and I'm going to embrace it for your glory. And I'm not going to be a victim to this sickness. I am going to be victorious in the middle of it. I'm going to trust you that out of it, you're going to get glory and you're going to fulfill your purpose. And you can put any kind of situation in that. Any kind of situation.
But that's the principle that we're being taught here. And then it says, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. (laughs) When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. I so love that. I I wanted to read that again. Because he, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus did not try to bring justice himself. He wasn't in a position to do that. And when you've been wrong, when you've been hurt by someone else, you say, God, get them, destroy them. I, I think they need to be wiped out. And Jesus didn't do that. As evil as those men were, he committed them to God. Said, I'm not in a position to judge. God, I put it in your hands. And you and I have to do the same thing. Let's go back to our friend Ara. Ara actually has a longer story than what we saw today. And in private, he shared something with Kelly and I that wasn't on the video. He shared with us that when he was being persecuted, he was strung up by his ankles and hung upside down. And they took clubs and they took mallets and they began to beat him. In fact, you saw Ara's nice smile. Those are not his original teeth. They busted out all of his teeth and he had his teeth replaced. And they did unthinkable things to Ara. And he said, while he was going through that, he said the first few hits were excruciating, but then he couldn't feel anything. But in his mind, he kept thinking, I was called to this. God has a purpose in this. Jesus suffered like this. And I have the honor of suffering for his namesake. I have the honor of suffering for his namesake. You say, how can anybody do that? Well, Ara says, I'm no hero. He said, I'm afraid of spiders. And I'm afraid of crickets. And he said, if I'm afraid of them, I certainly can't handle this. It was simply the grace of God. Folks, no matter what you're going through, God's grace is sufficient to allow you to be a victor instead of a victim and to fulfill God's purpose and calling in the middle of it. Let's finish the chapter. Verse 24, speaking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Jesus' death on the cross was not only victorious, it was also vicarious. He died for us, he died as us, so that there's coming a day when there will be no more pain, there will be no more suffering. Even now in this life, because of what Jesus did and did for us and as us, we can trust him for healing, for deliverance, from reconciliation in relationships, for healing of emotions, for healing of bodies. But there's coming a day when Jesus returns where there's going to be no more sickness, there's going to be no more disease, and every tear is going to be wiped away. His suffering was redemptive. And it concludes in verse 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And I so love that. Remember, we said that we are pilgrim warriors. There's a war for our soul. We're fighting for our soul, but I'm so thankful that it's not just me, that I have an overseer and a bishop of my soul who's watching over me, and his name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, May you enable us to see ourselves as citizens of heaven, simply passing through this world as pilgrims. Empower us to be vigilant in battling for our souls. May we live as free servants who are submitted and obedient to your word and free to love. I particularly pray for those in this auditorium and listening on the internet or on radio. I pray that those currently going through a time of suffering, you would give the grace to see it as a redemptive calling. That they would embrace the suffering with the purpose of seeing your redemptive purpose fulfilled. Take them through it victoriously in Christ. And may we all rest in the shepherd and overseer of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I know in this auditorium, there's undoubtedly some that have never committed your soul to Christ. If you were to die tonight, you don't know what would happen to your soul. But you can have an assurance. And you can make a commitment to Christ today. And I would love to pray with you. If that's you, I'd like us all to pray together. Let's pray. Say, dear God, I know that I've sinned. I know that I failed. 
But I believe that Jesus died in my place. But God, you raised him from the dead. And today, Jesus, I confess you as Lord. Be the Lord of my life, and I'll follow you all of my life. Amen. Now, if you pray to prayer or something like that, God's begun a great work in you, and you need to let somebody know. Great way to do it is reach in front of you, grab one of our connection cards, fill that out. In just a moment, we're receiving this morning's offering. Drop that card in the bucket, and we'll be praying for you this week. Or, even better, at the end of the service, there's prayer teams along the front. Give them that card. They'll pray with you, and they'll give you a gift to help you in your walk with God. Let's stand to our feet and congratulate those people today. And let's prepare to receive this morning's offering before we go. I'm going to tell you, our North Campus is just going great. We uh, got the signage up finally. And if we can just get a string of good weather here, we're going to get the whole thing completed for the first phase. And it was your giving that made it possible. And let me tell you the difference it's making. When we were meeting in the high school, we had just over 200 people. Now we have over 400 people attending that North Campus. And it's because of your faithfulness and your giving and because of your heart for the kingdom of God. So let's get ready to receive this offering today. I want to thank those watching online. You can, you can give online if you'd like, but we're just so glad to have you viewing this broadcast. Let's pray and let's receive this offering as an act of worship and praise to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give today. Not grudgingly nor of necessity, no, but because you love a cheerful giver and we love you. We want to honor you through our gifts and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give him worship. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. I know he holds my life, my future is in his hands. Sing it again. Because he lives. sure that we, we go from here knowing that God is with us, He is good, and He's always going to be there. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and He cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance to you and give you His peace. You are dismissed.